Hi, everyone. Welcome back from our break. Um, so our next session for today, I think, is going to be a lively discussion. Uh, so let's get right to it. So it's Warner Walsh, and he's going to be talking about workflows for the FreeBSD project and evaluating some of what we can do in a Git world, I believe. So let's see, Warner, are you ready? Uh, I was automatically muted and um, Okay, so I have video. I don't have video um, from my camera, um, but I'll just I'll just talk into that if people can just listen to my talking slides. So let me bring my slides up. Yep, that'll work. Yeah, I don't know what happened. I had video earlier. Now it's off, so I don't have time to troubleshoot it right now. So can you see my slides? Okay. Yeah, yes. you can turn it back on. You just turn it off for the break. If you hit your button, it should come right back on. Uh, OK. Um, whoa. OK. <clears throat> I will give that a try, except I'm presenting. So I'll, I, don't, I don't need video to present. Um, anyway, today I'm going to talk about um, the FreeBSD workflow um, that we have. I've been looking into this for a number of months. I uh, hosted a. Um, a uh, couple of uh, roundtable discussions. Um, it was motivated because you know we've recently moved to Git in the past six months, and Git lets us um, Git opens a lot of doors for us for improving our uh, workflow. Right now, the transition to Git was purposely a great leap sideways, where we um, moved to Git and kept about the same workflow, mostly to get uh, people in the project used to the new tools. Um, get our users used to the new locations, get all the documentation updated, um, and get all the internal project processes that we're pulling from Subversion, pulling from Git. Uh, there was a lot more there than um, I had anticipated when we started this. Um, and so I s held a couple of best practices roundtable, hoping to say, well, these are the best practices. These are the things that work. Um, the project had recently moved to ASCII Doctor, and I can write ASCII Doc docs. Um, I had trouble writing um, DocBook docs. Uh, so I thought, hey, this would be great. And in doing that, I learned a lot. Um, in addition to talking to the people at the roundtable, uh, several individuals uh, reached out to me, and I had productive conversations with them. Um, I also talked to our bug busters. Um, to see how well Bugzilla is working out. Um, and Mark Winneman had uh, some extensive uh, information that he shared with me. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. Also, while this was going on, Fabricator announced it's going EOL. And we'll, the project will need to do something about that. But you know, I can summarize pretty much every single conversation I had as some version of, um, there's too much friction. And um, the friction is something that presents a needless barrier to entry or requires additional time for people to do um, <clears throat> for people to do their work or for um, even for uh, people to contribute to FreeBSD who aren't developers or in some cases for users using FreeBSD. And this is an area that we um, should be, that should be the focus of any of our efforts to improve our workflow. Um, I have a number of types of frictions that are listed here, um, ranging from the simple simple actions take extra time. Um, you know, right now, if I wanted to commit somebody's submission in Fabricator that's been reviewed. Um, I have to manually transfer that to my computer and manually transfer a bunch of stuff. And even though Mark uh, Johnson's scripts have made that easier, there's there's still some area for improvement. Um, but it's more than just tool integration. Um, some of our policies um, and our current setup don't work well. I went and looked at the number of GitHub pull requests we had open. We had 42. Um, maybe 10 of these um, were bogusly open. And I, by that, I mean the fix was there. It had been accepted, and someone had committed it. And the uh, pull request simply wasn't closed. 
Now, sometimes they committed exactly what the pull request was, and sometimes um, somebody else fixed exactly the same problem and the pull request was obsolete. So those were easy to close. Um, and then in a number of cases, there was um, a good discussion. Um, hey, I want to do this. Oh, fix this. Okay, sure. And it became, you know, it was something that wasn't good, perfect initially, but became good. And, um, but then it was never committed for whatever reason. Um, and so this is kind of a common theme. We have the same problem in Bugzilla. Um, and so we need to look at ways that we can um, have some oversight for when the normal policy, you know, when the normal uh, functioning of the project uh, fails. Um, another area of friction is uh, sometimes as developers, we try to do too much. Um, somebody submits a patch that's almost good and you spend a lot of time dinking around with it and um, trying to figure out, you know, stuff that we could easily um, ask the submitter to do and um, more efficiently use the developer or the reviewer's time um, than uh, doing any, you know, than, than, than we're doing now. Um, there are also a number of uh, technologies that can improve quality and we could leverage that. Um, our existing CI is okay, but it's after the fact. There's no screening of new submissions with it, for example. There's no validation of uh, reviewed submissions for that. So we, we, can imp we can use that to both improve the quality and also improve the um, efficiency of the project. Um, so, uh, and finally, you know, there's a few of the issues I looked at, both in Bugzilla and in um, the, the GitHub pull request. Um, didn't have, it was unclear who was going to do things. So uh, it wasn't clear who was going to do the commit, so nobody did. So having a, a clear definition of roles and, and having that become ingrained um, and also you know, having some, what happens if that doesn't happen, having some fallback that's relatively easy and lightweight, um, I think are what we need to do. Um, and so I've talked about tool friction right now uh, a little bit. But, but, but right now, um, the, the tools that we use are, they're adequate maybe, but they're not good or great. Um, you know, there's a number of manual steps required to take extra time. They don't fully leverage everything they could. They need to be better integrated. And a better integration would help, but not solve the problem. Um, we have, um, like I said, policy or friction. And these are policies that we're doing we're executing what we think we want to do. And it turns out what we want is wrong because it's creating extra work for our volunteers. Um, uh, you know, we document things poorly. So the submissions that we get are not very bad. And we have, um, you know, an inability to um, get to closure on a lot of issues. This has been a perennial project problem going back to the use of NATS even. So it's, it's not, it's independent of tools. And then finally, I heard from a number of people that we have what I'm calling clutter friction. Um, and that's, you know, other ways of saying this is it's very easy to get overwhelmed. If I go out to Bugzilla, there's no way for me to go look at like all the storage problems or all the um, uh, MMC problems or anything like that. It's, it's a very big um, set of problems that come up by default. And it takes a lot of work to winnow that down into a, a useful list that you can look at and glance at and know whether or not to do things. And so you spend all your time finding stuff to work on, and then you find you don't have any time to actually work on things. So um, it's difficult to focus on um, you know, what needs to be done next, because also there's a mix of, of quality in the bugs for, from, this is a perfect bug report with a perfect fix to, uh, yeah, I booted and it didn't work and nothing, not a lot else. Now, Mark has done a good job of, um, actually uh, removing some of those, but, but, but you know, the, the, the quality problem still remains. So to make progress on this, um, you know, we've been, a lot of people have been talking for a long time, hey, we got to fix it. Well, we need to do more than say, hey, we got to fix it. Um, we need to articulate a set of problems that we want to solve. 
and we want to have a number of measurable goals that we can use to, to solve them. How do we know we're making progress? How do we know we're working on the right thing? Um, so, um, you know, and we need to understand the timelines. So I'm thinking that we need to uh, figure out where we want to go and then figure out how we're going to get there. Um, and that probably needs to be a working group and it probably needs to be maybe even um, several different uh, subgroups um, to make this happen. So looking at the tools we have today, um, Fabricator. Um, Fabricator is on its way out. I think there's not gonna be anybody that says, I wanna use Fabricator forever. I'm sure somebody will ding me on IRC and say, oh no, I want to use it forever. But um, Fabricators reached, the original developers have said it's reached end of, out, end of life. And um, I'm going to actually punch George after the session because he told me he did what I told him to do. Um, but uh, it's also a, a poor match uh, for um, our workflow. It's hard to get emails out of, commit messages are difficult to curate. And we need extra tools to make it only a pain to use. Um, so while there's no brush to move away, because we've got instances that you know we can use and modify if we need to, um, we need a plan um, to move. And this was true before um, the end of life was announced, and it's just as true afterwards. It didn't make it less necessary. Um, but Zilla. We're doing a, probably an almost adequate job of keeping up. Mark um, is doing a good job of uh, filtering uh, and directing the bugs, um, but we can do better. And this is one area where I think, um, you know, we've done as well as we have through heroics, but we'll need some automation to, to, to take, to, to, to do better. Um, Mark has reported that um, he thinks we're either barely keeping up or not keeping up or falling behind, depending on which week I've talked to him. Um, none of those is a, yeah, this is no problem. Um, it's not entirely clear if um, the problem is, would be solved by a different bug system or if we need um, other tooling to solve it or there's cultural things we need or there's we need to reorganize how we use it. Um, so those are things that the working group I'm seeing would uh, need to discuss um, Jenkins. Um, this slide was in, this quote was in yesterday's, um, this quote was in yesterday's um, uh, um, core report. Nobody hates the pro uh, Jenkins more than I do um, from Lee Wynn. And he clarified that it's mostly the email that he gets either from people, uh, either from people who break the tree um, uh, and he gets extra email because of that or um, because of the email he generates and sends to them because they broke the tree. Um, so it's, it's very frustrating for him. Um, you know, it, currently all of our testing is um, after commit. Um, it creates a lot of things, but it also leaves the tree, or it, it catches a lot of problems, but it also leaves the tree uh, broken for a while. And uh, which can be frustrating if, um, again, it's a, another source of friction where um, you go to uh, do something and you build and it doesn't build. Um, <clears throat> so we need to uh, work on that. Now the test scripts um, uh, that we that um, Lewin has had are dependent on Jenkins and work will be needed either to make them be dependent on something else or to make something else use the Jenkins results. Uh, and it's unclear what the best pass forward of this. The good news is that Lieberlin wrote a lot of his scripting to make it easy to move away from Jenkins and the actual scripts themselves have no dependency on, or the actual tests themselves have no dependency on um, Jenkins, but instead depend only on ATF and QA. Um, we're using Cirrus CI, which is great. Ed Mast uh, wrote a script that does um, a simple smoke test whenever you push a branch to GitHub or GitLab. Um, I've used this uh, and it works okay, but um, 
since it's using the free services, there's limited CPU time available. Um, and you know, we could do more in this area because it's, uh, but, and the testing isn't directly tied to GitHub or GitLab, but um, that's uh, where Sarah CI gets the, pull, uh, the um, branches and changes to run its tests against. Um, and we also have a, a number of people policies, like a, a, our people policy process, social problems um, that we need to address. Um, if we think we can just change our tools and everything will be great, I think um, that's an unrealistic expectation. Um, one of the big things I noticed was that the, pro the process lacks oversight. Um, there's nobody that goes around and goes, oh, um, you know, this looks like it could be committed. Let's ping somebody to uh, make it committable. I found four or five, um, I believe, changes in the GitHub pull requests that I sent email to Hans. Hey, Hans, can I fix this? And Hans says, yeah, that looks good. Um, and I was able to push it in. You may have noticed I made a number of commits. Um, so what do we do when things drop on the floor? Uh, ports uh, maintainers have a two-week timeout, and that works that works okay in the ports tree where all that's being updated is um, basically a leaf node port. Um, but even the ports tree has you know, special rules. If there, if there was a maintainer timeout for a critical port, the, the, the result wouldn't be an instant uh, massive upgrade of that port. There are other processes in place. So there's degrees of degradation that um, source could use and doc could use um, to uh, help with this. Um, the other thing that uh, I noticed is other projects aren't shy about telling people, hey, this patch needs to be improved. Here's how. Send it back to me when you've improved it and then moving on. Um, we've historically been really bad at telling people no or break this up into smaller changes or you know, make this reviewable or even providing guidance on what a reviewable patch is. Um, so um, you know, we need to you know, look at ways um, and changes to the way we do business so that we can make better use of more people in the community, um, which will also probably have the knock-on effect of um, getting more submissions from users landed into the tree and, and getting them more engaged and maybe even growing um, and maturing uh, developers in the community. Um, so I talked a little bit about the, the people problems. Um, I'm a little bit short on time, so I'm gonna, the next few slides, I'm gonna kind of breeze through. Um, the last point on this, I think is, the, the, the two points that I wanted people to take away are, what do we do when the process fails? There's no backstop. And um, you know, how can we as a project uh, get better about um, saying no and providing the right kind of review at the right time? Um, also, what happens when our process breaks down? You know, maintainers get busy, people go on vacation, um, people lose interest in the project. All these things need to be accounted for in our process. And right now, well, what happens? Eh, basically nothing. And so um, this leads to very poor, um, you know, user experience or submitter experience or contributor experience that they, um, people that want to uh, help out are, are discouraged because they, they try to help and they're basically rebuffed. Um, it doesn't matter internally why they're rebuffed. You know, did we do the first five of the six steps we needed to write and then drop the ball? Well, to the external committer, it doesn't matter. In fact, that makes it even worse. Um, you know, because, oh, hey, they did something and then nothing happened. That's even worse than just being completely ignored. Um, so we need to find a combination of automation and uh, people, I think, to uh, work on this problem. Um, the, the division of labor is is more of, you know, how do we, um, you know, how are we able to use our developer resources better? One way of doing that is by having um, things to review land in their lap pre-screened, um, either by uh, a person that takes a quick look and goes, yeah, that looks like it might be good. Um, or you know, that isn't um, trying to sell me erectile dysfunction pills. You know, it's a legit change. Um, 
And uh, also it's been through some automation that says, well, at least it builds and the first level of um, you know, style has been checked um, and uh, you know, it gets bounced back to the uh, contributor right away and they have a chance to um, improve and update it um, for us to take a look at it again. Um, one of the problems in the past, there's a lot of people will take a look at a patch and go, oh, you know, I, I don't even know where to begin to say that this is wrong. And rather than provide even that feedback, it's like, I'll, I'll go to the next one that's easier. So the project has had a, an ability to, to provide feedback that's, that's negative and to um, uh, close issues that um, are rejected as actually rejected, whether that be uh, feature requests for system D, although I think all of those are closed or um, you know, patches that um, check to see if something's not null, um, that never should be null. Rather than fix the underlying problem, it puts a Band-Aid on, on, on it and doesn't actually solve anything. And as you can imagine from the rather animated way I'm talking and the speed at which I'm talking, um, I could go on for a long time, but um, that's, it for, uh, that's it for the summary. We need to have some strategic goals. And as I mentioned earlier, we need to reduce friction. And there were four areas of friction that I came up with um, to make the workflows go more efficiently. Now, there may be others, and this is just a, a preliminary list, but I think it's a good place to work from. We need to reduce the friction of screening submissions. Um, when, we, when we get a submission, how can we validate it that it should go on to the next step or reject it? automatically where nobody needs to be involved or they need to be involved maybe just at the last step to, to click OK. We need to um, reduce the friction in reviewing, revising, and, and or rejecting submissions. Right now is hit or miss. Um, and once we have a submission we think is good, um, it passes the basic test, how do we validate it so that we want to land it in the tree? And how does this you know, feed back to the other parts of the step? And finally, how do we make sure that it gets incorporated into the tree? Um, and another key option of thing is we need to reduce latency at each step, um, even if that means rejecting more things. And the reason we need to do this um, is if we can have a low latency to rejection or to feedback to make it better, we can get better submissions um, when people uh, are still interested in the problem. If I uh, see a patch from four years ago, I know that the likelihood of my sending it back to the submitter saying, hey, yeah, I know this is OK, but you only handled half of the cases. What about this other half of the case? Can you modify it? I'm going to get a, probably crickets or an angry email about how I ignored you for so long and now I'm demanding things or something like that. And finally, we need to look at ways of adding resilience in the face of process failures. We have some OK processes. Um, and if we come up with better processes, they will fail. And we need to figure out, you know, what do we do when something doesn't get a review? What do we do when um, something looks like it should go in but hasn't for some reason? What's the, you know, how do we unblock the system uh, for things that catch in any of the phases of the system? Um, I also looked at. Uh, possible solutions that would be, just be a drop-in. And nothing's just a drop-in, but um, we have a GitLab cloud-hosted solution where we, we basically take everything and put it on GitLab, uh, GitHub, sorry, and um, we do all our interaction there. That has its pros and cons that are too numerous to mention here. Um, we could do the same thing with GitLab. Different set of pros and cons the advantage with GitLab over GitHub is that Bugzilla is integrated with GitLab, but it's not integrated with, with GitHub. There are a couple of dead projects that look like it tries to, but there doesn't seem to be anything. We could also run a self-hosted uh, GitLab. Um, that would mean we would use the current uh, credentials and we would have the current branding that we do that we would lose with the cloud-hosted uh, solutions potentially. Um, some people have mentioned Team City. Nobody's stepped up to volunteer to do any work on that. Um, and when I heard Garrett mentioned it all, um, 
it usually was part of the phrase, dear God, anything but Garrett. Um, I think there was one person who mentioned it, remembered it favorably, but all the others were just no. And um, when you look at other projects, other projects use email to manage a lot of this. And the only reason that it works is they have a lot of automation built around the email, not because of email itself. Um, although uh, some of the projects seem to think that it's because they use email and it's so simple that it works. I disagree with that view. And you know we're certainly not set up as a project to do that. Um, and it would take a lot of rejiggering. It would be a very high friction way of solving this problem. So we have basically you know three potential um, solutions, maybe four, um, that could help us, that we could measure against the goals of reducing friction. Um, none of them are clearly the best way to go. All of them have issues, and we need to figure out which issues we can live with and which issues, you know, what trade-offs we want to make. And that's why we need a working group, um, you know, to basically work through all of these issues and figure out well, you know, GitHub looks good. Is it really? GitLab looks good. Is it really? Um, you know, what are the, the pain points um, of, of each of those? And we need to do this in a way that is not um, a never ending navel gazing contemplation exercise, but that um, makes progress and moves us forward to having a more, a more friction free environment. Um, and so, um, you know, a lot of the trade-offs and nuances um, are uh, hard to um, uh, do in a large setting and need a more focused setting. Uh, so also all the requirements that we would use to judge what is the best, um, they're not really articulated now. Most people have a good notion intuitively about maybe what might be a good set, but nobody's sat down and, and written them all down. And all of these are tasks uh, for the working group or subcommittees of the working group or something so that we can move forward. Um, and um, so did I just drop out of presentation mode? I think I did, sorry. Um, so one of the things that we also need to do is we need to set a measurable goals. If we have a working group, we're going to need some oversight of that working group to make sure that um, they're working towards a, you know, making progress towards the solution, that they have a set of well articulated goals. Um, in addition, that we put into place um, metrics about, you know, what, what makes it successful. Let's say we chose a particular solution. How do we know that it's it's working for us? Are we getting, you know, did we decide, hey, we want more contributors or we want more commits or we want a higher velocity or we want the build broken less? Well, we need to measure those things. And, um, you know, we need to measure it before and after the cutover to see if it's working. And it's gonna be something we need to continually look at. Oh, we tried solution X, it didn't work. Maybe we need to try solution Y or tweak X or something. Um, you know, this isn't gonna be a, a fire and forget sort of problem, but something that we need to deal with on an ongoing basis. Um, and so I've talked about most of the proposal. Uh, we, need a, we need a working group to work through these issues. Um, we need to have a good combination of short-term and long-term goals. Um, a sh short-term to get rid of the worst of the problems we have and longer-term to solve some of the more systemic things. And I'm proposing that this be an open process to anybody who is willing to constructively participate. And if you are willing to show up and do the work and respectfully um, communicate, and um, you know, there's a seat for you at the table. Um, and I'd like to open it to all members of the community, not just people with commit bits. I think having um, a diverse group of people here uh, in terms of where they are in the FreeBSD ecosystem will make the entire ecosystem better and we will wind up with something that works better for the community and we might get a more healthy community out of the result. Um, I'm also proposing that I'm the initial chair to get things going, but you know, if somebody really has a fire in their belly and wants to plow through all the nuances of um, you know, project management and technical duty uh, issues and uh, project politics, 
you know, I'm open to having discussions about that. Um, so I think I've taken most of my time. Um, there was one answer in the Q&A. Um, uh, um, you can read that about, if you'd like. Uh, the, the, um, I'm reading it, it's long. Um, but basically it's, uh, what is the project policy on handling bugs filed against releases no longer supported? Can they be closed outright, leaving the cinnamon or someone else to reopen a new bug? Um, I looked at one yesterday filed against 9.1 where the bug clearly indicated it hadn't been fixed in the newer release um, and the submitter just wanted an MFC. Um, I think that's a, that's a great question, but I think it's a little bit beyond the scope of what we can talk about here. But that's the, exactly the kind of thing that we need to uh, be more um, clear about and document better. So um, I, were there questions in IRC? I, when I'm presenting, I can't tell. When I'm just talking to Alan, I can look at IRC over my shoulder. The one that Christoph had um, in the Zoom call is he said, one thing he really wants from bug tracking is the ability to kind of put into a state which says, it needs more information and auto close in some predetermined amount of time if the information doesn't come back. Yeah, that's a, so like, that's a I think that's great. I think that's a popular suggestion, you know? Yeah. And I think this is, I mean, I think part of what, like it's similar with David's question that you read, um, some notion for how to not have bugs linger in kind of this weird limbo state, like figuring out ways to be, to have more bugs be a little more actionable and get to close one way or another. Um, mm -hmm. And not because I think it's right now being open is a very ambiguous. It can mean a lot of different things, and so it's also frustrating for users because they don't know which of the in different things being open means. If someone looked at it and said, "I'm too polite. I don't want to say no," or nobody's looked at it, or it just means too many different things. Or I've got a patch in my tree, and if you know somebody asked me about it, I would actually spend the thirty seconds to rebuild it on the you know latest tree to see if. Uh, the other bug that was preventing me from working on this had been fixed yet. You know, yeah. nobody knows if it's, you know, an inch away or a mile away from being committed. So, um, so steps forward from here um, is, um, you, know, you know, we have a number of open questions, you know, on uh, where do we go from here? And we need to, to kind of figure out a long-term game plan and, and a short-term, uh, you know, some short-term tactical things we can do. Um, the first of the short-term tactical things is uh, this discussion probably needs to move to the hallway track. I'm either two minutes short or three minutes over on my time slot. Um, You're I think, a little over. <laughs> I think three minutes over. And that was, I gave one version of this talk where it took me an hour. So. I've done a good job of condensing, but I think it shows that I planned poorly with the time slot I requested. Um, and I uh, will need to talk in the hallway track after this talk and uh, both, you know, before the next talk and this afternoon and, you know, figure out how we can get the uh, uh, working group going. The Git working group had its last meeting on Wednesday or Tuesday by the way. And so there are some people who are working on it that have suggested we um, uh, use that time slot um, and start this working group there. And so that's probably going to be where I start this, um, but I'm also interested in, in that. So, and I even spelled Garrett wrong, it looks like. Well, <laughs> that shows you how seriously I took it. I couldn't even be bothered to, 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 to look up how to spell it. I mean, in, in their defense, there are people who like Garrett. I think part of what you, what I said in, in the round table is that people tend to be very warm or cold. Um, and actually in our group, there was one person, Simon from Juniper, who was kind of, he was like the first person you had encountered who was just kind of medium, like it's okay, yeah. I can use it. but he didn't like love or hate it. Whereas a lot of people seem to have a very much, very strong opinions one way or the other on Garrett, um, not a lot of middle ground. It's one of the few things that's more polarizing than, than signing the GitHub terms and services. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, well, I think probably time-wise we need to go jump into a break. And I think you're right. The hallway track is a great place for folks to follow up with more 
questions or other things about this topic. Um, so we've got a few minutes. We'll do about a five minute break here before we go into our next working group. And I, I certainly think we probably can't fit a lot of talk about this into the next five minutes. So um, probably after the whip sessions today, I think we'll probably have some time in the hallway right. track where we can discuss this further. Yeah, I, I, I have some other engagements, but after the, um, this all be hit or miss. Okay, um, I mean, but, but we have after time the, tomorrow as well that we can use in the hallway track after the closing session. So we'll, we'll find some time that we can, several of us that, that folks who are interested can get together and we can talk about this. Yeah. More. Yep, that sounds good. Um, either, you know, after, you know, the, either around the, the work, after the work in progress sessions, maybe today, or, um, you know, sometime tomorrow afternoon, if we don't get enough time today. Does that sound good as a yeah, and and, 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 and okay. I'll, and I'll uh, we'll, we'll figure out how today goes, and then if we want to, I can announce it tomorrow if we need to continue tomorrow. Right, so and, let's and, go with that. and it doesn't all have to get done this week. We can um, do stuff later, um, and I can send out an open invite and just have people show up, and I'll you know manage that, and we'll go from there. Okay, sounds good. Thank you, Warner. Oh, you bet. Thanks, John. Okay. So let's go ahead and have another five minute break. And when we come back, Mitchell Horn is going to lead a session on risk five.